This is the discrete math MAT 125 lesson number 14 for Ma's Little Theorem and Modular Arithmetic. Okay, so the first thing we'll do is ask what is Fermat's Little Theorem? And the statement of Fermat's one version of how you can state Fermat's Little Theorem is the following. If P is a prime number and A is any natural number, then P divides A to the power P minus A. How about an example? Let's take P equal to 11. That's a prime. Let's take A equal 3. That's a natural number. We have natural numbers being 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and on. So any positive whole number for A and any prime for P. And now let's see what this theorem would imply. It would say that 11 divides 3 to the power 11 minus 3. So it's pretty interesting because 3 to the power 11, that's pretty big. So we're saying 11 divides 3 to the power 11 minus 3. Well, I definitely need a calculator to figure that out. That's actually 177,144. And, um, well, we can confirm that's true just simply by dividing again on the calculator. Um, 177,144. If you divide by 11, you get 16,104 exactly. So this is just illustrating that it's in fact true. This is nothing like a proof. All right, but, but hold on. Did, did you really catch that? I mean, this is saying that this is for any natural number A. So I just picked three at random, but I could pick two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, forever, any natural number, and 11 would divide that natural number to the power 11 minus that natural number. It's true for any natural number. As long as you start with a prime, it will divide into this quantity for any natural number A. So, in other words, P divides into A to the power P minus A for any A natural number if P is prime. So we just showed it was true that 11 will divide into 3 to the power 11 minus 3, but 11 will divide into th also 4 to the power 11 minus 4. Uh, that will work. 11 will divide into 5 to the power 11 minus 5, and that will work for every single possible natural number. That's quite, uh, that's quite a statement. And these, get, these numbers get really big really fast, so, you know, I mean, you know, give Fermat some props there for quite a statement to, to be able to... That's, and that's just the little theorem, right? <laughs> I mean, look at this. 5 to the power 11 minus 5. Can my calculator handle this? 5 to the power 11 minus 5. Yeah, okay, that's not so bad. Uh, that is 4, 8, 8, 2, 8, 1, 2. Somehow, I believe that 11 will go into that. So if you take that 48, 8, 2, 8, 1, 2, 0. What are we dealing with here? Uh, 48 million, 828,120. Uh, hmm, let's see. Can you divide by 11? I don't know. Yeah, sure enough. 44,000, no, 44, 3, 8, 9, 20. 4,438,920 exactly. So, yeah, that'll work. Continue. 6 to the power 11 minus 6. 11 will divide into 7 to the power 11 minus 7. On and on, every natural number. Wow. Proving it is another task for another day. There's other videos on YouTube that prove this. I'm going to do some examples that use this and talk about um, modular arithmetic. Uh, not all of the topics and not all in general, just a few examples that are useful for the assignment in the Math 125 class, but hopefully would be interesting for anybody else that might be interested in learning you know, some, some interesting math, uh, math concepts. So let's proceed. So these are the topics I'll cover in this video. Uh, Fermat's Little Theorem 
first and calculations in modular arithmetic and congruences in modular arithmetic and calculating remainders for large numbers and applications of Fermat's little theorem to testing for primes and an application of modular arithmetic to determining the day of the week for a given date. Let me make a few uh, notes about notation. Notes on notation. So one of the notations that I want to use is if I wrote, you know, if p divides um, a to the power p minus 1, we write this uh, vertical slash. And here what I want to say is, well, just sticking with Fermat's theorem, little theorem, I would have done that. It doesn't really matter. I mean, the notation is p divides the quantity a to the power p minus a would be just a way of writing um, Fermat's theorem. So I would say Fermat's theorem, Fermat's little theorem, p divides the quantity a to the power p minus a um, when p is prime a is or a is a natural number. So that's one of the notations that I want to introduce and uh, there's another big one. Well the notation I want to introduce is like when when you see this expression a divided by m has remainder b. For example, for example, 15 is congruent to 3 mod 6 because if you take 15 divide by 6 it goes two times with three left over. So 15, the, div, the remainder, when you divide 15 by 6, is 3. Another example, 30, that's congruent to 6 mod 8, because if you take 30 and you divide by 8, 30 divided by 8, it goes three times with remainder of 6. And it's equivalent to saying that the difference between 30 and 6 is divisible by 8. 30 minus 6, that's 24, and 24 is divisible by 8. 8 goes into 24. I want to write one other thing, that if we had a congruent to b mod m, and the mod is a, sh is a shorthand for modulo, and modulo means that you're sort of dividing with this value of m. Uh, so if, if we had a is congruent to b mod m, and there's more to say about what that word congruent and why that's used, but uh, moving on, sticking to uh, what I wanted to do here, I would say this means that you could take the number a, and if you divide it by m, you would, you would get b as a remainder. So what we could do is we could say, if you took m multiplied times some quotient, then b would be the, b, b would be the remainder. So it would look like that. Also, means that a minus b is equal to m times that quotient, or m divides a minus b, right? m divides the quantity a minus b. If I say a is congruent to b mod m, I'm saying m goes into the difference of the two, the difference of a and b. Okay, a couple of other examples. I wanted to do, so let me run through those. Let's say 18, that's congruent to 7 mod 4. Um, this, let me make these true or false. Let's say some, we have some true or false questions. Uh, 18 congruent to 7 mod 4. Well, one there's a couple ways you could do it. One is to look at the difference, 18 and 7, the difference is um, what is it, 11, which is not divisible by 4, so that's why I can say false. Or you could say, what happens if you take 18 and divide by 4? 4 goes into 18, well not 5, it'd be 4 times, 4 times 4 is 16, that leaves me 2. So the remainder is 2 and not 7, and so once again, this is false. Right, so 18 divided by 4 has a remainder of 2, not 7. Uh, as another example, let's say, let's look at 25 congruent to 1 mod 2. So again, true or false? True or false? 
Well, um, there's a couple ways, two ways, two quick ways you could do it. I mean, the, really the fastest here is to say, look at the difference of 25 and 1. That's 24. And that is divisible by 2. So this is true. That's a quick way to do it. Um, and I mean to get to this later, but basically what's happening is this modulo is sort of creating a values that are in some sense equivalent. It's kind of creating classes is really the word for it. They're equivalence classes. And so you could break up into four different classes or two different classes. Obviously, when you do mod two in two different classes here, we're talking about evens and odds. And so this is one of the really deep fundamental properties of what this modulo thing is about, is this sort of like kind of grouping things into equivalent values in some sort of module, you know, a modulo, you know, according to some 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 uh, you know classification. So uh, let's see. I had one more on here. I was going to do as an example of this basic uh, kind of calculation. Let's look at 20 congruent to 10 mod 2. Once again, that's a quick one to do by just saying, look, the difference of 20 and 10 is 10. Uh, so this is true. Um, and by the way, actually, you could say that it's also, you know, 10 is congruent to 6, which is congruent to 4, which is congruent to 2, which is congruent to 0, all mod 2. Right? So that's the point about, like, all the evens are congruent to each other. Um, if I put one more on here, let's say, uh, you know, 25 congruent... Um, let's say, is 25 congruent to 2? 25 congruent to 2 in mod 2. Though well, the difference is 23, and it's not divisible by 2, so this is a false. So, yeah, this is an odd, this is an even, they're in two different equivalence classes, and that's another reason why this is coming out false. All right, let's look at a few other examples um, that have a different form. Let's say the question is, find the least non-negative residue, which is just a fancy way in the language of congruence to say find the remainder. What's 50 congruent to in modulo 7? So we're basically creating seven different equivalence classes. And where would 50 fall? It's basically then saying, if you divide by 7, 50 divided by 7, what's the remainder? And that puts it in um, into a, one of those equivalence classes. So 7 goes into 50 how many times? Well, it goes 7 times. Uh, 7 times 7 is 49. So the remainder is 1. So 50 is congruent to 1 mod 7. And, and you can also see 50 take away 1, that's 49, that's divisible by 7. So that is the least uh, positive, because there are other values that um, 50 would be congruent with um, in mod 7, but this is the least uh, non-negative residue that it's equivalent, um, that, yeah, that it's congruent to. Right? Okay, so how about another example, number 2. Let's take 25, 64, uh, congruent to what in mod 10? So direct way to calculate this is just divide by 10 uh, and see what the remainder is. So 10 goes into 2564. Well, it would go 256 times, uh, and that would give you 2560. So the remainder is 4. So that's the least positive uh, residue. That is um, the smallest number that's equivalent to 2564 modulo 10. One more, how about 60 congruent to what mod 60? So the question was to find the least non-negative. So it's okay if you get 0, and that's exactly what happens here. Uh, if you take 60 and you divide by 60, it goes exactly one time. 60 times 60 is I mean, uh, 1 times 60 is 60, and 60 minus 60 is 0. So 60 is equivalent to 0 mod 60. That's the least non-negative remainder, um, or, or the least non-negative residue. That is the remainder. Some of the work that I'm doing here might be familiar to you as what's called clock arithmetic. I'll make a quick mention of that, uh, the idea of clock arithmetic. is just modulo 12. Right? So for example, if you said 1800 hours, you could just say, what is 18 modulo 12? Well, it's 6. Right? Because if you took 
18 and you divide by 12 hours, it goes, oops, <laughs> goes one time with 6 left over. So 18 is congruent to 6 in mod 12, and so that's just another way of writing it, is to say uh, 18 mod with 12 is 6. 18 mod with 12 is 6, or 18 is congruent to 6 in mod 12. So we could also write things, you know, like what's what's 3,571 modulo uh, 9, 19. So you could just do that as a sort of a function. If you take mod any value um, of any other value, what would you get? So we're asking 19 goes into 3571. How many times and what's the remainder? So use calculator. 35 seven one three five seven one divide by nineteen goes a hundred and eighty seven times and you do nineteen times one eighty seven and you get thirty five fifty three so the difference here let's see eighteen okay that's interesting just made it right eighteen so um, actually, and this this brings up a point that that I, I needed to make somewhere here. Um, if you just do three fifth three thousand five hundred seventy one, and you divide by nineteen on the calculator, of course, you're going to see one hundred eighty seven point nine four seven three six, and and it goes on. So you can't really use the decimal to tell what the remainder is, right? The remainder was 18, and that's not apparent from the decimal. So that's an important point, of course, to be uh, careful with. You're not reading off the decimal. The decimal isn't going to tell you uh, directly what the remainder is. Um, what, we could, what we could do is we, we could say the way that they relate, the remainder and that decimal is as follows. If we were looking at, um, let's say, um, what do we do? 35, 71, you divide by 19, what you ac actually have is 187 and 18 nineteenths. That 18 nineteenths is the decimal, 0.947, etc. So that's the relationship between the decimal and the remainder. It's um, it's the remainder divided by nine, you know, by the divisor that would produce the decimal. So yeah, in all these sort of modular arithmetic questions, when I'm looking for remainders, I actually have to include some sort of long division calculation. Although I am not doing the long division really by hand, I'm using the calculator most of the time because the numbers are big and the calculator is fast. Uh, but I actually really need to look at the remainder carefully and not just the decimal. Now let's go back to Fermat's theorem. It says uh, if p is prime, then p will divide a to the power p minus a. Then also we'll say p will divide, and I'm going to factor out an a here and say a to the power p minus one because I just factored out an a. And it'll look like that, right? So if you multiply the a back, you'll get a to the power p and then minus a. So now I'll say, suppose in addition, p does not divide a. That slash, so p doesn't divide a, means not, right? So if you know that p divides all of this, but it doesn't divide a, and it divides all of it, it has to divide, well, it has to divide this uh, expression, right? Then p would divide the quantity a to the power p minus 1 minus 1. Well, this means that if p goes into p goes into this, that means p times some quotient uh, or some quantity is equal to that, right? This means a to the power p minus 1 minus 1 is p times some number. Therefore, you could say a to the power p minus 1 is p times some value q plus 1. And what I'm talking about is q is you know some natural number, some integer, positive integer. So what I also, imp so what this means is that the remainder is 1 when you divide a to the power p minus 1 by p. And all of that means 
a to the power p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p. So this is a special case of Fermat's little theorem. So the special case of Fermat's little theorem is if p is prime, a is a natural number, and p doesn't go into a, then p will divide a to the power p minus 1 minus 1. Or equivalently, a to the power p minus 1 is actually congruent to 1 modulo p. This will be a particularly useful and interesting little special case of Fermat's little theorem that involves some sort of like test for primality of, of numbers, for checking whether something is prime, has lots of applications in, uh, you know, applications in computer science, in cryptography, and encryption, data encryption. Is, uh, has to do with uh, the, the, you know, the, um, the use of prime numbers because there isn't any fixed pattern at which prime numbers occur. And when, so what's really fascinating here is that um, if, you, if you multiply two numbers together, it's very easy to do on a computer, uh, quickly multiply two numbers together and, and get the result. But it's very difficult for even a computer to go backwards, to take a big number and figure out what the two factors are. So we don't have any shortcuts. And so and you don't know whether something is prime or whether it could be factored or what those factors are. Uh, when the number is really big, even for a computer, it could take effectively forever or, you know, uh, yeah, effectively forever to figure out what, what the factors are. So that's a key to protecting data is using uh, very large numbers that um, you don't know what the what the prime factors are, uh, unless you know. You, well, it was it's encrypted that way. So the key is knowing what those prime factors are. And that's the only way to unlock the data. So I'm going to just state without proving that it's also true if you multiply both of these by some constant. So for any k. That doesn't seem too surprising. It's like in normal arithmetic that if you do the same thing on both sides of an equation, it's still true. It's true with this congruence in modular arithmetic that if you multiply both sides by a constant, it's still true. Um, that's not hard to prove, but I want to move on to another uh, conclusion that imagine if you were to multiply both sides, let's say um, a to the power p minus 1, and you multiplied both sides by a to the power p minus 1. So starting with this, multiply both sides by a to the power p minus 1, that would be congruent to a to the power p minus 1 mod p. Right? If I multiply both sides by a to the power p minus 1. So uh, you could continue to do that as many times as you want. Well, let's say a to the power p minus 1, a to the power p minus 1, is congruent to a to the power p minus 1, which is congruent to 1 mod p. Right? So by continuing to multiply by another expression, a to the power p minus 1, I keep getting 1 in mod p. So conclusion there, it's not really a proof, but it's a sort of suggestion as to why that could happen. Basically, what I'm going to use is a to the power p minus 1 multiplied any number of times. It's going to stay 1 in mod p. So I'm going to use that to do some calculations. Let's do this example. Let's say um, 5 to the 653 power is congruent to what? mod 11. Well, 5 to the power 653 is just too big for any normal calculator. Uh, 5 to the power 653, the calculator just crashes. You might be able to figure this out on a computer, but typically with a calculator, it just can't be done. But it's kind of neat to see how Fermat's little theorem uh, can, can uh, unlock this. Okay, so basically it's these two. But I'm looking for, um, all right, so let's look back at the question again. Power uh, 5 to the power 653 
is congruent to what in mod 11? So this is these kind of tricks that I'm doing here with these calculations of these remainders for these really big numbers only work if I've got prime numbers here. So, and also this prime can't go into that base. Right? They at least have to be what are called relatively prime. There has to be no common factor between the prime and the base that you have. Right, so 11 doesn't go into 5, so this will work. So I'm using a to the power p minus 1 to a power n is always going to be congruent to 1 mod p. So I need to get that 653 into some form like this. So, some, some in terms of 1 less than the prime, in other words, in terms of 10. So I need to write that 653 in terms of 10. So what you could do is say 5 to the 653, that is congruent to 5 to the 65 times 10 plus 3. Basically just dividing that by 10, seeing what's left over, and that's congruent to, well we can say 5 to the power 10 to the power 65 times 5 to the power 3, and this is mod 11. 5 to the power 10 is congruent to 1 mod 11, and it doesn't matter what power you raise that to, and it's still congruent to 1. So this is basically 1 times 5 to the power 3 mod 11. This is 125 mod 11. Well, now I've gotten rid of this. It's no longer such a big number. We could just figure this out directly. What's the remainder when you divide by 11? 11 goes into 125 11 times. 11 times 11 is 121. So remainder is 4. So 125 mod 11 is 4. So the remainder is 4. Si 5 to the power 653 will be 4 modulo 11. All right, let's do this one more example here. 9 to the power 865 is congruent to what in mod 7? So of course, again, 9 to the power 865 is way too big to do this on a standard calculator. Uh, maybe with a computer, uh, but uh, yeah. So we have a nice little trick here with Fermat's Little Theorem, or a special case of Fermat's Little Theorem, where we can apply a a trick to kind of unlock, figure out what the remainder would be if we divide by 7. Okay, so what's the what's the rule again? What I'll do is I'll use this um, congruence that a to a power p minus 1 raised to any other power n would always be congruent to 1 uh, mod p. But this works when p is a prime number uh, and the p value cannot divide the a value and the a and the n, they can be any numbers. So because this particular example involves mod 7, we really need to put this, um, pow or this uh, number 9 to some power. We need to express it in terms of 1 less than the prime. Uh, so we have to write it in terms of uh, 6. So let's see if we can do that. We're basically looking at 9 to a power 865 and trying to figure out how can you write that as 9 to a power 6 uh, to some other power. So, well, uh, you need to divide that 865 by 6. So, 865 divided by 6, it goes 144 times. 144 times 6, that is 864. 864. 864. So, we get a remainder of 1 there. So, this is really um, 6 times... 144 plus 1. These are equal, and also I can say they're congruent mod 7. Well, the trick would be then to say this is 9 to the power 6 raised to 144 power times 9 to the power 1, all modulo 7. So it's right here that I have 7 does not go into 9, and the p is 7, and so I have a power 6 here that's one less than that, So, and it doesn't matter what power you have here, uh, this will always go to 1. So this is basically 1 times 9 mod 7, so that's 9 mod 7. 
So what's the remainder if you take 9 divided by 7? Well, 7 goes into 9 one time with 2 left over, so the answer is 2. So that's it. The remainder is 2. If you take 9 to the power 865, you divide by 7, you get 2. Okay, let's look at an example application of Fermat's Little Theorem. Primality tests. So again, Fermat's Little Theorem says for any a, a natural number, if p is a prime number, then p divides a to the power p minus a. That is for any natural number a. Now the contrapositive of Fermat's Little Theorem would be for any number a, that's a natural number, if p does not divide a to the power p minus a, then p is not prime. So Fermat's little theorem is true, and thus the logically equivalent contrapositive is also true, and so we could use this contrapositive to show a number is not prime. And now look again at Fermat's little theorem. For any a, it's an element of the natural numbers, any number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, if p is prime, then p would divide a to the power p minus a for any natural number. What about the converse of this statement? The converse would be for any natural number a, if p divides the quantity a to the power p minus a for any natural number a, then p is prime. That's the converse. Well, it's not true, but the first value for which this statement fails to be true is p equal 561. Even though 561 does divide a to the power of 561 minus a for any natural number a, which is an amazing thing to be able to just to imagine proving, that can be proven true. So even though 561 will divide any expression a to the power 561 minus a for any natural number a, because 561 is 3 times 11 times 17, it isn't prime, and thus it disproves the converse of Fermat's little theorem. So the converse of Fermat's little theorem is not true. This is the converse. For any natural number a, if p divides a to the power p minus a, then p's prime. That's not true. That's the converse. And numbers like 561, which do satisfy the first part of this statement, but are not actually prime, are called Fermat pseudo-primes, or Carmichael numbers. And it's the understanding of occurrence and properties of numbers like these that will be part of understanding the principles of number theory that are at the heart of cryptography and encryption methods. It's something that we take for granted, these principles of mathematics, and use on a regular basis, even if we don't recognize it, when we're using credit cards to buy things online. These credit card information that we are using is encrypted. Those methods of cryptography are uh, hinge on the properties of prime numbers similar to the properties that we're seeing here with Carmichael numbers and Fermat's little theorem. Now let's finish off with one kind of fun little uh, example of ap an application of using the mod function. Calculating the day of the week for a given date. Suppose you're given a date with year Y, month M, and day D, we can use the following procedure to determine the day of the week for that date. So it's an algorithm and it works like this. We'll have three steps. The first step is to say let's calculate J of M where M is the month so this is a function for each month and so what I'm doing is I'm making 0 Sunday, 1 is Monday, 2 is Tuesday, 3 is Wednesday, 4 Thursday, 5 is Friday, 6 for Saturday, and 0 back to Sunday. So I'll be doing a modular 7 arithmetic here. And this table here is something that you couldn't memorize. Um, I wouldn't expect you to memorize, but um, it's, it's basically the result uh, Essentially, like if you were to go all the way back to year zero, uh, what day of the week would each month have started on? 
So we'll use that for our step one. And then what we'll do is we're going to say step two, if we're given a month of January or February because of the peculiarities with the calendar and how leap years happen in February, at the end of February, um, the way this algorithm works is that you'll have to subtract from one from the year if you're doing a calculation for January or February. Otherwise, given any particular year, we calculate G for that year as a function of Y as follows. So what we're going to do is take the year, take the year divided by 4, and just round off the decimal. Take the year divided by 100, round off, um, divide by 100, round off the decimal, divide by 400, and round off the decimal. The reason I'm doing this is because actually if you look at the way the calendar works, each year you go one day later in the week. Except if it's a leap year, you go two days later in the week. And the way our calendar works is uh, we have um, leap years every four years, except not on century years. So those are years that are divisible by 100. But we do have leap years if the year is divisible by 400. So uh, I did a whole video on the history of the calendar, and I will link that here uh, in the description and up above. But um, I'm not going into all of the details here, just this is the algorithm, this is the formula, how it works. Um, and so once, yeah, as you're doing the calculator, the notation that I'm using here is you're basically rounding down uh, because you, you don't want to count a year that hasn't finished yet, basically what happens. All right, and then the third step is to just take whatever day you're calculating, add on how many days in the week you started within that month, and then ha add how many days have accumulated over all the years since year zero, and divide by seven, get the remainder, and whatever you get is to tell you the day of the week. So let's do an example. This one's kind of fun. This is July 17th when I'm recording it, and it turns out July 17th, 1821, that's when Spain sells Florida to the United States. So what day of the week was that? Here we're looking at July, so the month is 7, the day is 17, year 1821. So our step one is to just look up on that table for July would have started basically, uh, what is that? Um, that's a Friday, on year zero would have started on a Friday. So then if you take the year 1821, every year from year zero, you'd add another day in the week. Uh, and in leap years, you'd, so we're saying how many leap years would that be? So you divide by four and you just round it down because I don't want to count any years that we haven't yet, um, any leap years that we haven't yet uh, passed. Uh, then we divide by 100. How many century years is that? So it's about 18, right? 1821, that's 18 centuries. Uh, and you just round down because you're you haven't got to the next one yet. Uh, and then how many years were there divisible by 400 um, th that we have passed so far? So you just round down 1821 divided by 400 and just round it down. So no matter what decimal you got, even if it was a 0.9, you just round it down in this calculation. Out all those up 2262. So now the thing to do is to take, say, all right, so um, July would have started on a Friday and each year, this is basically another accumulated day, uh, and then we're actually counting all the way to the 17th day, so if we add all that up, divide by 7, 2284 divided by 7, that's 2, so it was a Tuesday. That's pretty neat. It's kind of fun. Okay, and that's it. That's where this video ends. Thank you very much for watching.